Good morning, everyone. This is Gabrielle Dara, and I am the moderator for today's webinar. On behalf of HBK and MRG, I would like to welcome you to today's discussion about the relief programs and guidelines triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic and how they specifically apply to healthcare practices. We truly appreciate the sacrifice healthcare providers are making to care for others, and our goal is to share information and resources to help overcome some of the financial and operational challenges caused by this crisis. Our session is scheduled for 60 minutes and is being recorded. A copy of the recording and presentation will be emailed to all attendees. You may also access these materials by going to our website, hbkcpa.com slash COVID. Please note that all attendees are set up in listen mode. You may submit questions in the control bar and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Presenting today will be Michael DeLuca, who is a principal at HBK and a leader of the Healthcare Solutions Group. And Randy Penberg is also joining us. He is CEO and president of MRG, a provider of billing services and solutions for the healthcare industry. In today's discussion, Michael will be covering the Paycheck Protection and CMS Accelerated Advanced Payment Programs, and Randy will be addressing the expanded guidelines for telehealth visits. At this time, I'd like to turn over the presentation to Michael. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here on Good Friday for those of you celebrating. Um, I will ha have a last minute note as, as we continue to say through these various programs, they are highly fluid, changes by the hour. And so one additional note that we'll touch upon uh, in this presentation that, that was just released uh, just a few hours ago from Health and Human Services was the first tranche of funding under the CARES Act. It's a $30 billion dollar tranche uh, that was released um, to Medicare fee-for-service providers. So uh, a lot of you may have seen a deposit in your accounts for those uh, uh, practices and facilities who have Medicare fee-for-service reimbursements. You may have seen a deposit this morning. We will uh, be touching upon that in what we know as of now, again, uh, just released within uh, the last few hours. We're going to start this morning by touching upon the PPP. Uh, my hopes is that a lot of you have already applied or have been talking with your CPAs, accountants uh, here at HBK or, or elsewhere, as well as your financial institutions and bankers uh, regarding your eligibility uh, and what the PPP means for you. Uh, this was a program initiated under the CARES Act as well that was signed into a law two weeks ago to the day. It allows qualified businesses to apply for a loan with an approved SBA 7A lender, it falls within that program, uh, with a potential portion of up to 100% being uh, forgiven. Uh, I think for those of you who have gone through the process, are in the process, maybe even waiting on approval or funding, um, it has been anything but straightforward, and it has been highly fluid. We'll touch upon what we know again today. We, we feel like uh, the loan application calculations have been more or less solidified with the last round of Treasury uh, guidance released Monday evening of this week. Uh, and we'll walk through the mechanics. Uh, for those of you who may even have had applications pushed back on you, we'll address that. Uh, or, or we'll be uh, also talking about kind of next steps under the PPP and what it means for you. Uh, next slide, please. The qualifications were that you are a less than 500 employee, uh, small business organization, 501c3 nonprofit. Those are kind of the main two buckets for healthcare entities that, that we know of, we see. Um, there was a lot of chatter uh, at the origination of the CARES Act saying, well, do medic medical uh, providers even qualify for the loan? This, this is absolutely a yes, right? There are some nuances, though, as it, as it relates to especially private physician practices. Uh, a lot of you may contract out um, physicians or extenders. Um, those uh, individuals are deemed either self-employed or operate as a sole proprietorship or single member LLC, maybe even an S Corp. Um, those contracted physicians mid-levels must apply separately from the practice or facility. Um, as of today, and this was confirmed uh, Monday evening with, by Treasury, 
those independent contractor payments are not included as a payroll cost on loan origination or will be forgiven uh, to the practice or facility uh, when you go to apply for loan forgiveness. So this was a big confirmation, big change uh, from the early stages of the PPP program where a lot of financial institutions, a lot of banks were, were requesting this 1099 information. Uh, we do know it is rather prevalent in the healthcare sector to have such arrangements uh, with physicians and, and mid-levels and extenders. And so we wanted to clarify that for you. These are not included uh, on your loan origination payroll cost calculation or will be in the forgiveness. Next slide, please. The maximum amount of the loan, you take your average monthly payroll costs incurred in the one year period prior to application. We've taken this position a lot as April 1st, 2019 through March 31st of 2020, or you can use the 2019 calendar period uh, for your calculation. So it's an either or method. There are two uh, primary that fall under those uh, 12 month uh, periods that are blessed, if you will, that will cover the majority of taxpayers who are seeking such loans. There are special calculations for seasonal or new employers. If it's a brand new practice or brand new organization that has just started, there, there may be some nuances to that. You take your monthly payroll costs, uh, which we'll define in more detail because I know there's been a lot of gray area around what constitute payroll costs. You multiply that by two and a half uh, plus any amount you have taken uh, under an EIDL loan uh, that's kind of more or less the $10,000 working capital fund under a separate SBA program of the EIDL. You add that to it, or $10 million. Uh, we have yet to see a client of $10 million on the lesser of calculation, uh, so mostly it has been the payroll cost multiplied by two and a half. Next slide, please. And I am going through this uh, a little bit more rapidly on the PPP. They will be available afterwards, just uh, with the impression that most of you have uh, have applied for this already, just touching on some main points, uh, not only for considerations if an application comes back to you, but also uh, for uh, when we tee up next steps and what you should do now that your application is submitted and, and even possibly on its way to funding. Um, so what are the payroll costs here? Uh, so those include salaries, wages, commissions, or similar compensation. That number and only that number, which I'll reiterate here again, is capped at 100000 per individual. You add that to that vacation leave, parental family medical sick leave, um, payments for dismissal or separation, payments for any retirement benefits that employers pay. So it's employer provided retirement benefits, group, group health care benefits, again, provided by the employer. Um, the gray area there is if you are self-insured, um, there are some um, nuances to that on what, what we feel may be included as your employer provided group group health care benefits, uh, again, if you are a self-insured organization uh, for health care that you provide to your employees. Uh, add to that state and local payroll taxes, uh, and, and that is more or less your payroll cost. The last bullet point there, again, it caused a lot of confusion because it is included as a payroll cost as sum of payments to a sole proprietor and independent contractor. Again, it has been clarified. This language was included while it was certainly not delineated in the original act. It was included to specifically address those sole proprietors and independent contractors. So when they mentioned that, it's actually viewing it from their side, not necessarily the organization or practices side that contracts that physician mid-level extender in our situation. Next slide, please. I will reiterate before jumping into what payroll costs do not include, that compensation limit was something that even I had been working with banks this past week, as, as recent as yesterday, um, clarifying a lot of individuals thought the $100,000 cap, which a lot of clearly physicians would fall under, uh, is inclusive of all benefits too. So they were thinking, oh, compensation plus benefits is capped at 100. That is not accurate. It, only the compensation, the cash compensation piece should be capped at 100,000. Any employer provided benefits, uh, again, retirement benefits, group health benefits, other benefits that the employer pays out of pocket, for any employee that makes over 100,000 can be in addition to that $100,000 cap. Very important delineation there. Payroll costs do not include, again, that anything paid to an individual employee over 100,000. Uh, this is another area where it came to, when we say taxes imposed or withheld under chapters 21, 22 
or 24 of the Internal Revenue Code. That speaks to uh, uh, the, the FICA taxes, federal income taxes withheld, uh, and it said during the covered period. Uh, a lot of people took that one step further, saying, hey, the employer side can be added too. Um, that is not accurate. So again, Treasury confirmed Monday night, employer paid FICA taxes uh, uh, are not included as payroll costs. They're not included on the, the loan origination proceeds amount being requested, and they're not going to be included in the loan forgiveness from what we know today. So the employer side of the FICA taxes should not play a factor into your calculation. The only side that plays a, calcul plays a factor is if you're doing a trailing 12 months. If you are using the April 1st through March 31st time period, from February 15th to March 31st of 2020, you must back out of the calculation the employee side of federal income taxes withheld and of the FICA. So it's kind of a downward pressure on eligible payroll costs if you're using a trailing 12 months calculation. If you are using just a straight calendar year 2019, you do not have to back out any employee paid federal income tax or FICA withheld as none of that could fall underneath the cover period. Again, that does not apply to any employees, again, or making over 100,000 since they're already at a cap. Uh, compensation of employees who principal residence is outside of the United States. That's a direct question on the application that you had to submit to attest that none of that is being paid to such individuals. Uh, also, payroll costs that are paid as part of any sick or family leave wages for which a credit is allowed under 7001 or 7003 of the Families First Corona Relief Act. That was the first relief act uh, issued oh, about 10 and signed into law about 10 days before the CARES Act. Um, that is the piece that there, you will receive a payroll credit uh, for any payroll or payments made to employees that fall under the expanded qualified sick or uh, FMLA standards. Next slide, please. So next, if you have applied and you're waiting on your funding, what are going to be the allowable use of funds? Uh, from what we know today, I will caveat this that says so much attention from the SBA and Treasury has been placed on the front end here. They wanted to get the funds out. So much guidance has, and efforts have been educated, or dedicated rather to uh, the front end of what constitutes uh, to get loan proceeds. We are expecting uh, much more additional guidance on the loan forgiveness piece. They've kind of put what's out there in the act. There hasn't been too much um, delineation or clarification on many of those kind of gray areas or vagueness in language and ambiguity in language uh, for the loan forgiveness. So bear with us. Uh, what we know today is what we're going to present here. Payroll costs as defined, we just define them. We think the same definition is going to apply to loan forgiveness. Okay, so no employer side of that. Uh, of the FICA uh, taxes withheld, but we do think group health, uh, employee retirement benefits. What we don't know there is if, let's say there's an employer profit sharing plan and you're accustomed to making an annual contribution at some point. Uh, what we don't know now is if you make the annual contribution in your eight week window, will all of that be forgiven or will a pro rata amount of that be forgiven? And we'll touch upon how we're, we're taking a step-by-step -step process with our clients to try to be flexible enough during that eight week window um, to uh, take advantage of to the maximum we could the loan forgiveness on whatever may come down the pipeline regarding guidance. Uh, in addition to payroll costs, uh, again, this is where the interest on mortgages, this is where rents, um, interest on debt, other debt obligations is in there as well. Right now, from what we know, we believe it's reasonable to assume that equipment loan interest uh, that you pay during that eight-week period uh, is included in this calculation. So many uh, facilities or practices certainly have uh, medical equipment in there. Uh, that interest right now, from what we know today, has not been excluded. Uh, so we, we, uh, we think that that may be uh, an includable forgiven cost. Again, I'll touch back on rents. Uh, all it says is including rent under our lease agreement. Uh, so if that's going to remain so broad and, and vague, leasing of equipment, uh, could be office equipment, could be medical equipment. Uh, we don't know for certain if those costs would be forgiven, but it's certainly if the language stands as is today, uh, it very well could be that those payments uh, could be forgiven. Again, um, reiterating what Treasury came out on Monday, uh, anything that's a non-payroll cost will be capped at 25% of the actual loan 
forgiveness amount. So no more than 25% of your loan uh, forgiveness amount can be uh, uh, used for non-payroll costs. And then the last allowable funds that we know uh, as it stands today is utilities, electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, internet. Uh, a lot of questions on this I've been fielding is, is we've gone to a much more mobile workforce, clearly, uh, do cell phone costs. Are, are those included in telephone? We don't know uh, at this point. Again, uh, nothing has been dictated on that, but cell phones have, have certainly replaced traditional landlines, especially like an environment like this. It's reasonable to believe at this point, cell phone costs, very employer provided cell phone costs very well may be included as an, as an allowable use in a forgiven amount. Again, more to be determined later. Transportation, we fielded a lot of questions on car allowance. Is that included? Uh, it's my position that would not be a forgiven cost, a car allowance to a physician or, or to a, an extender if they're traveling long periods or, uh, of, of miles a day. Uh, those are not, it's more so transportation as utility of, of the business, which is probably um, not as prevalent, especially in private practice. Uh, next slide, please. So what are potential reductions to the forgiveness? Um, really, the base calculation is the average number of monthly FTEs. Um, if those were reduced in a covered period, so that eight weeks, relative to what you apply for either from the February 15th to June 30th, 2019 period, or the first two months of 2020. So we're going to look at total FTEs um, at the eight-week period, right, and compare that to one of those two periods that you applied for. Uh, the reduction in FTEs, from what we know today, that would be a percentage reduction in the eligible amount of loan forgiveness. Um, also, you could take the employee salary, wage and salary decrease during the cover period. So during that eight weeks, if an employee's salary that you've kept on, so it counts as you're an FTE, if it's decreased greater than 25% compared to the most recent full quarter of which the employee was employed prior to those eight weeks. So I know a lot of practices said, hey, we're going to keep FTEs on board. We may reduce their pay 20%. Under that situation, I don't see where the FTE calculation would come in if, if, if it's very similar or identical in the FTEs. Um, I also, we don't see that in what we know today in the guidance, if it's reduced by 20%, you wouldn't be negatively impacted. It's only the percentage reduction over 25%, which would then count towards your loan forgiveness. So if you reduced employee pay 30%, it would be that 5% delta between 30 and 25 that would decrease the loan forgiveness. That's the guidance as it stands today. Again, any employee earning an annualized salary more than 100,000 uh, during any single pay period, which you use during 2019 or the 2012 months, are excluded from this calculation altogether, um, right? Because you've already tapped them. So that means that from the wage and salary decrease, they're excluded not necessarily from the full-time employee standpoint, but they are excluded. There's a little bit of interplay there if you're doing some planning on kind of what to do with these PPP you know, funds. Do I bring back employees? Do I bring back more of my workforce at a reduced rate? Do I bring back less at their full rate? Um, that's gonna be a very practice-specific question or facility-specific question that we've been, we've been use, utilizing with our clients one-on-one -on -one as we begin to plan for the next four to eight weeks. Next slide, please. Um, again, a potential reduction to forgiveness is if you were awarded an emergency advance at $10,000 working capital loan under an EIDL program, that will be deducted for forgiveness. Um, that, that loan in and of itself, um, from what we know, we haven't seen a lot of those funded, actually. It's been tripped up a lot. They have not been funded as quickly as what uh, was originally anticipated, uh, but that number would come back off your loan forgiveness because that loan itself should be forgiven anyway under that program. Next slide, please. Uh, another nice nuance here, what could be nice, is rehiring is permitted. It's, it's, the, the language is a little bit confusing how they put it, but basically any reductions, if, if you are an organization that already has reduced headcount, you've already furloughed employees or laid employees off altogether or reduced your workforce between February 15th and you get a grace period all the way till April 26th, right? If you had any sort of um, reduction in, in employees or a reduction in labor force, uh, between that period all the way to April 26, you will not be penalized if you eliminate that reduction by June 30. So it kind of gives you a window of time there to really say, okay, if we start slowly coming back in May, or if we start slowly coming back in June, is it an opportunity for maybe I don't need to 
automatically go to 100% of my uh, pre-COVID-19 workforce, maybe maybe I'm able to take this in tranches. There's clearly um, implications and consequences to that or could be uh, for bringing people back on when, when you're laying in other considerations like unemployment, um, especially for administrative or, or like medical assistance or that that level of professional. But, but we would certainly want to uh, look at that as you start to plan out and take advantage of uh, the grace period of any sort of rehiring in a very logical and strategic sense that may make um, uh, more more sense for your organization. And next slide, please. So some specific considerations here, if staff or staff pay have been reduced, uh, here's, here's what I would consider as a plan going forward, what we've been communicating to clients, very important for cash flow timing. So PPP, we'll talk about the uh, CMS Advanced Payment Program here next real qu quickly. Business lines of credit absolutely should be the last line of defense, third line of defense. Oftentimes, uh, the owners of the practice clearly would have personal guarantees on that, uh, maybe some collateralized assets. Um, we would rather take advantage of these other programs that don't require that for, um, for, for our uh, owner physicians of the practice um, and work through the, the tranches here, PPP to CMS advance to, to the line of credit. And then factoring in, hey, what, what's a reasonable expectation of operational revenues now? You know, right now it's really hard because of, of no elective procedures going on. Uh, it's really difficult to, to, to project such numbers. It really is unprecedented. I know that's a common word being thrown around a lot, but it truly is unprecedented. Uh, but doing our best, uh, making those estimates and creating flexible strategic plans is, is kind of key during this time. Uh, speaking of which, we want to try to get even to our staffing levels. You know, what was pre, what do we need during, and what, what we're looking at as a post eight week period, right? We need to balance estimated productivity levels. You know, there could be situations early on where you may be able to bring back half your workforce because of PPP uh, ramifications and the payroll costs and loan forgiveness. So you're more or less getting those costs subsidized for you. They may be idle for a time, but that may make sense, right? Because I don't think it's going to be the faucets automatically turned on and patient flow is going to return to normal, but it may be gradual and you may have the staffing there to not put yourself behind the eight ball should you receive more uh, more appointments or, or more flow than what was anticipated. Uh, again, analysis of rehiring full-time employees at reduced pay levels or less full-time employees at full pay. I think that's a, a, it goes beyond just the PPP. We'd certainly want to uh, consider those implications in the loan forgiveness, but also, what, again, what makes strategic sense uh, for the practice. Uh, and, and really consider what full-time employees uh, are most crucial to the practice and facility. You know, is it the employed physicians? Is it the extenders? Is it medical assistants? Is it the administrative? What do you need? And, and you hate taking such an approach of, of saying you kind of want to get lean. You've got to get lean during these times and say, okay, not just for the next 30, 60, 90 days, but, but what is our practice really going to need, you know, for the remainder of 2020 to put ourselves hopefully on the other side of this curve um, into 2021. Uh, and again, brace for that idle time. Uh, we think the STEP approach right now offers a lot of flexibility for our, our practices and facilities. Um, we'd probably start the conversation at that point. Uh, again, do we bring back 50, 60% and then kind of step it up, taking advantage of that rehiring grace period. Next slide, please. This is a little bit of just uh, blocking and tackling here. We've been telling our clients, establish a separate bank account for the loan proceeds to fund, right? And through those eight week uh, pro program and through the eight week testing window rather, link all your payroll costs, all the allowable use expenses into that one account. It's gonna be an easy tracking mechanism for us to show one, what we feel like the forgiven loan amounts are gonna be. It's gonna be very easy to support when you go to apply for loan forgiveness, right? It's not gonna be muddled with uh, lockbox deposits or uh, any other activities and other bills or supply bills. Uh, we have one separate account. All that is is used for is the PPP funds. We're gonna link our costs for those eight weeks. It should be an easy turnaround or a, a lot more clear turnaround for the loan forgiveness piece uh, to, to be able to utilize such a strategy, right? Next slide, please. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit from PPP to the CMS and other items that uh, were, were issued under the CARES Act. Again, we're going to touch on the HHS um, um, release of payments this morning as well. Um, the CARES Act, first thing it did was provide sequestration relief uh, for, from May 1st of this year to December 31st 
of this year. So basically, Medicare is going to pause that reduction in reimbursement due to sequestration, which should result in a 2% increase in Medicare reimbursements for the remaining part of this year, beginning May 1st. So that was the first kind of act that's going to apply to uh, all Medicare reimbursements. Uh, that sequestration will be um, uh, lifted for the eight-month period. Next slide, please. So CMS expanded their accelerated advanced payment program. Um, now, if you're an eligible Medicare Part A and Part B provider and supplier, uh, you may request up to 100% of your Medicare payment for a three-month period. So we're taking that as probably your prior three months, so January through March. Um, anything you have been reimbursed by uh, Medicare, if you're an eligible provider and supplier, you can now request through uh, a, a MAC uh, a state-specific MAC, an amount that is up to 100% of that amount as an advance payment uh, for Medicare reimbursements. To qualify, you would have to bill Medicare for claims within 180 days immediately prior uh, to your request form. Uh, you must not be in bankruptcy. You must not be under active medical review or a program integrity investigation. And you have not had any outstanding delinquent Medicare overpayments. Next slide, please. So again, you, you can request an amount up to 100%. It doesn't mean you have to go to 100%. Uh, we've been utilizing this program as a supplement to the PPP, right? So we think the PPP, because of the loan forgiveness piece, uh, is, is your first tranche, your first vehicle to go take advantage of uh, in relief that you need to go apply for. Uh, the expanded uh, accelerated advanced payment program, this should be the next tranche, okay? So this should be also considered either in supplement or uh, secondary to the PPP program. Uh, this one, again, you must apply through a MAC. Uh, the MACs have stated uh, you can apply electronically via fax, uh, via mail. Again, electronic submission will be the fastest way. The MACs have stated that they're trying to return these funding within seven calendar days of request. So we do know of practices that have applied for this early on. Um, they wanted to go ahead and get this in the door. They have the right mix, um, and, and they have already been funded uh, with AAPP program receipts uh, just from a cash flow support uh, mechanism here before PPP may, may be coming in. Okay. Repayment for most providers and suppliers who are not hospitals uh, is extended to not begin until 120 days after payment issuance. Next slide, please. Hospitals do have up to one year to pay it back. Okay, so that's separate. Uh, we'll focus on other providers and suppliers. They have 200 days from the date of free, uh, payment to repay. So how this is going to work, uh, once you get funded with any sort of requested funds, you now have a 120-day period there where uh, it's completely deferred. It more or less turns it into a four-month interest-free loan, if you will. Um, again, sequestration apply or no sequestration rather applies. You will receive full funding for Medicare reimbursements in that 120-day window. Uh, once the 121st day comes about, any Medicare reimbursements submitted after that will automatically be recouped and applied against this advanced payment. Okay, so any claims you submit after that 120-day grace period, uh, the reimbursements on those will automatically be applied to this loan balance that Medicare uh, has with you. Until that, until that balance or that advanced fund is paid in full. If that balance is not paid in full within 90 days after the grace period is over, that's where the 210 comes in. So if you haven't repaid it within three months, uh, it will be due uh, upon, it will be due immediately uh, thereafter any unpaid uh, loan balance at that time. Again, there's been no mention of interest. Uh, it's an interest-free loan for that period. Uh, it's just a consideration here knowing that you're kind of more or less robbing Peter to pay Paul on the front end. It's, an, it's a true advance of payments that you would otherwise collect later this year. Uh, again, we feel the PPP loan offering is a still more attractive first option. We especially feel that way given the loan forgiveness cost right now, uh, and especially in, in medical practices, that's the bulk of your fixed overhead, right? It's the people, it's the space, the rent, uh, it could even be equipment loan interest uh, and utilities. The rest of it is a lot more variable, supplies, um, you know, materials, et cetera. Uh, so that, that piece of it we still feel like is the, the first best avenue to take. The AAP should absolutely be looked upon as a supplement uh, to the PPP loan or secondary to funding, as we mentioned, right? It provides immediate near-term financing, again, with seven days. Uh, could be before PPP loans are funded. Uh, right now we're hearing PPP loans could be seven to 14 days if it's approved today. Uh, anywhere in that window, it depends on 
a banking institution and when, when they submit it. Um, should the PPP funds be insufficient to carry you uh, in your planning, this is another great supplement program. Now, with this morning's release, uh, this is that fluid situation with this morning's release and the HHS funding, we certainly want to uh, look at that now as, as, as uh, another tranche, maybe even ahead of this AAPP program before we go to apply to that. Will that be enough to, to help carry and we don't need to go from an advanced payment program? Uh, the nice thing about this though, there is no stated limitations on how those loan proceeds may be used. So uh, while it's not forgiven, you can use it for any sort of working capital that is needed. Uh, and it, again, it's an interest-free loan for 120 days pretty much. Um, other considerations here, again, we can't stress it enough, the next 30, 60, 90, 180 day cash flow planning uh, is highly critical. Uh, I've had multiple clients comment to me, I've, I've never spoken to an accountant more in the last two weeks uh, than I have uh, uh, these past two. And I think it's going to be even more prevalent. I think we're on the early stages here to uh, get the funding mechanisms. And now the next step becomes, okay, how do we operationally deal with these, these challenges, right? That, that comes into the staffing. It comes into, again, taking advantage of these relief programs to the greatest extent possible. And it's going to be a very individualized uh, conversation uh, based on your practice mix, based on your leverage mix, right? Um, so what is your compensation model? How would a program affect this, um, you know, especially under an AAPP type payment? Um, Medicare is not going to care what physician, if you're an eat what you kill uh, model, they're not going to care what physician builds it. They're just taking first dollar. So how do we apply that on the tail end? Just considerations. They're not, they're not uh, deal breakers by any stretch of the imagination. But these questions are just uh, some of the things that we've been asking clients just to consider, work through with them. With them. Uh, again, it's not talking about a tax return here, right? We're talking about really true operations that are going to be critically important conversations uh, over that time frame. Before I switch to Randy uh, on the telehealth, we are going to mention uh, HHS funding. So uh, Health and Human Services this morning, uh, released uh, a, a notification in, in a letter that basically said the first tranche of, so let me back up one step, my apologies. Under the CARES Act, there was another $100 billion that was allocated towards medical providers specifically. Uh, I was on a call yesterday with Deloitte's head of health policy. She's based in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was hosting a webinar as well. Uh, she was mentioning this, but, but quite honestly, as early as yesterday afternoon, no one uh, had an idea of how this $100 billion was going to uh, be deployed. Uh, they had ideas that there was going to come out in three tranches, the first tranche being helping providers in kind of front lines, second tranche is being uh, possible rural communities, rural hospitals, third tranche being um, uninsured and possibly underserved communities. So that's what they feel like the third three tranches will be. Well, this morning, HHS came out. Uh, 30 billion of that 100 billion, that first tranche is, com is coming out. Payments have already started to hit bank accounts. Uh, this, these payments are uh, being provided to Medicare fee-for-service providers. If you had any Medicare fee-for-service reimbursements in 2019, you are going to automatically get a piece of this fund. Um, we've had clients right now that have seen anywhere from uh, seven to nine percent of their 2019. Uh, Medicare fee-for-service reimbursements, that's the percentage that has been hitting their bank accounts this morning. Uh, it was a surprise to a lot of our clients. We fielded a ton of questions. I know Randy uh, has as well on his end for, for what they do in their firm and organization. Uh, these fees, these funds rather, that have been deposited, no, these are not a loan. Uh, these, are, these are automatically forgiven from what we know today. This is just money being injected into these type of providers to help them with cash flow. So I strongly encourage, if you receive this, be, be on the lookout. If you haven't received it, don't worry. Uh, it's probably coming. Uh, they're being made. All the relief payments are being made to providers according to their uh, tax identification number of which they bill through. So if you're using another TIN to bill through it, maybe working its way through that channel right now uh, to get to your bank account. But again, if you have Medicare fee-for-service reimbursements in 2019, be on the lookout for that. If it doesn't hit your bank account in a week or so, I think it's another conversation to have with uh, your accountant uh, or your billing service provider, whomever it may be. Uh, note here, this is going to be given to the biller or the provider organizations. Employed physicians uh, or physicians in a group practice, meaning employees 
of a group practice uh, will not be eligible for any sort of reimbursement. The reimbursement is going to go to, or rather, the, the funding is going to go to the organization itself. So that is what we know today. Uh, we will be producing material on hpkcpa.com later this afternoon as we get a chance to digest this a little more. Again, this just really hit the presses a uh, little after 8 a.m. this morning, and, and clients as they uh, were coming in and, and practices as they were coming in and getting booted up saw some payments at their bank account from HHS, but we wanted to be sure to mention that to you all. Uh, Randy, I'm going to turn it over to you, talk about all of telehealth, and we'll do some Q&A at the end. All right, very good. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the latest changes regarding telehealth services. Um, historically, reimbursement for telehealth services under the Medicare physician fee schedule were really very limited. Over the last 30 days, you know, we could look at ourselves the way we have run our operations and how um, physicians are practicing medicine. But all of a sudden, we have providers who have never um, dip their toe into the telehealth um, pool and all of a sudden are now realizing in order to um, promote social distancing, they've had to get up to speed on what's required uh, to, in order to provide and be reimbursed for a telehealth service. Um, so I'm just going to highlight some of the big changes that have happened over the last um, 30 days um, for your information. Um, one of the um, components was that a doctor or provider can render telemedicine services from their home without needing to update um, provider enrollment with CMS. Um, CMS is advising providers to list the home address on their claim form, and, but and also stating at the same time that this will not cause an issue for claim payment. Um, what the, one of the biggest changes that has happened over the last um, few weeks is that um, Medicare will reimburse at the non-facility rate, or otherwise the office visit, if the service was to be provided in a face-to-face -face setting. So if you were um, normally would have seen the patient in the office and you're providing an evaluation and management service, instead of using the place of service 02 to denote a telehealth service, you would continue using the place of service 11 and reporting that with a 95 modifier appended to the evaluation and management services for those encounters. So what that it does is that the provider is not being penalized for providing a telehealth service because I think the whole methodology behind the telehealth reimbursement was that there wasn't a practice expense component, but I think the government quickly realized that in order for a provider to get up to speed in order to um, provide that type of service, there's going to be staff involvement so involved as far as getting a patient registered and those types of things that um, go along with. So um, billing the regular E&M service along with the 95 um, modifier with the place of service 11 will not have an impact on the reimbursement. Um, one of the other things that have come up is that there is a CR modifier, which um, would be used normally um, for catastrophe or disaster related services. For the telehealth services, there is no need to append a CR modifier. I think the government, CMS, the uh, Medicare carriers are all aware that we are in a pandemic. Um, one of the changes to the telehealth services is that telehealth services can be provided for both new and established patients. Previously, it was that a patient was an existing patient to a practice that would qualify for a telehealth service. Now, providers have the ability to address new patients as well. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services has lessened up or loosened up on some of the HIPAA privacy regulations uh, revolved around this service line um, during this crisis, most of it revolving around the method of how the um, provider is um, in contact with the patient. Um, they're ensuring that the provider is going to put safeguards in place and that, that the provider is not going to conduct a telehealth visit in a public forum, so that there is still going to be some privacy sensitivity, 
um, to provide this type of service. But on the technology side is where um, the Department of Health and Human Services has really scaled back on what would be acceptable modalities. Um, one of the other um, things that um, CMS has allowed providers to consider is waiving the cost share. So just like with any other Medicare fee for um, service, um, there is a deductible or coinsurance amount that would normally be uh, applied to any type of service provided to a Medicare beneficiary. Providers now have the ability to waive that um, cost share because I think one of the things that CMS is looking at, you know, very hardly, or you know, they're looking at now is that they don't want the financial piece to be a burden for access to care, especially during a pandemic. So if the provider decides they would like to waive the coinsurance or deductible amount that the patient may otherwise have um, to be responsible for, they're um, allowed to do that. One thing before I go to the next slide, there one thing that a question that has come up was um, telemedicine services across state lines. So if I'm a provider in the state of Georgia and I have a patient who has reached out to me for a problem who lives in Tennessee, am I able to um, visit that patient in Tennessee? CMS has waived licensing, uh, medical licensing requirements. As long as the provider is licensed in good standing in the state that they provide service, they can um, see patients or have telehealth services with patients in other states. Um, the claim would be filed to the Medicare carrier that the um, provider is currently contracted with. So like if I'm in Georgia, I still would be sending my claims to Palmetto, even if the patient was in New York State. Um, but one of the things that we do caution is that because then we're looking at, at each provider should check the state medical licensure boards to see if there are any requirements in regards to telehealth. But if it was a Medicare patient, there is no issue. So a provider who's licensed in the state of Georgia can see a patient or visit with a patient in a different state. Um, next uh, the next slide, please. Um, where I had mentioned earlier about the um, D, um, Department of Health and Human Services and HIPAA loosening up some of the um, HIPAA restrictions is the delivery methods. So some of the delivery methods that are accepted, um, Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, video chat, and Skype qualify as acceptable methods because there is some encryption involved there and that they can be set as private one-on-one um, -on -one, um, interactions with the provider. Um, some of the unacceptable where a provider could get dinged or fined by, um, for a HIPAA violation is Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok. And when I e was even looking through the regs on what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, I'm thinking from a Medicare beneficiary standpoint, if we had a, a grandparent who knew what TikTok was, I probably would want to meet them. Um, one of the other things, the DEA has loosened restrictions on the prescription of controlled substances during this time as well, is that a provider can have, be able to um, prescribe a narcotic during a telemedicine service. It used to be that the patient would have to present at the office and that there would have to be a face-to-face -face encounter. But as long as um, there is a visit, the provider now has the ability to continue um, writing prescriptions for controlled substances. Um, one of the things that has changed in this delivery model is that there are services that could be rendered via a telephone call. And there are a a specific subset of CPT codes related. So 99441 through 443 are for physician um, telephone call related to telehealth um, evaluation and management services. The 98966 through 98968 are for qualified um, practitioners. One of the other things that I had skipped over as well is that CMS has in expanded the number of covered services from 100 into 180. Um, so there is a whole myriad that CMS has listed on their website uh, that providers can provide telehealth services 
to skilled nursing patients, to patients in their home, to, um, to emergency room, um, that there were a number that weren't previously um, covered. Telemedicine services now can be provided by approved mid-level providers, such as you know, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and um, certified midwives. And like I said, there are a number of additional services that a provider can provide now via telehealth that weren't previously approved, like therapy. The irony about therapy, whether it's our PT, OT, or um, speech therapy services, is that they need to be provided by an approved provider. And in this scope here, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist are not considered approved for providers to provide those types of um, services. So it, the therapy service would need to be provided by a physician or by a um, nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Um, another question that has come up, um, and it's actually a good one because telehealth is new to so many different providers, is that in order to provide telehealth services, they do not need to be related to a COVID-19 diagnosis. So just as long as the service is reasonable and medically necessary, um, they would be considered a, a, a covered service. So just because CMS has loosened up a number of the guidelines for telehealth services, doesn't mean that it needs to be related to somebody who may have been exposed to COVID-19 or who may be presently um, inflicted with COVID-19. Um, one of the things you would note with each of the CPT codes that are assigned for the different types of telehealth services, um, the evaluation and medical uh, service level is either de um, defined by the complexity of the medical decision-making or by time. And each CPT code has a defined amount of time that should be spent. Though the time component certainly needs to be documented in the note. Um, for Medicare, for um, telephone only services, like I said, there are a, a several new CPT codes, 99441 through 443, that would be used for physicians. Um, the 98966 or 98968, these um, services are um, would be used for social workers and for therapists. So for these types of codes, and you will see that the reimbursements are significantly lower than that what we would see for an E&M service, but these are truly considered an evaluation and management service. Um, and they are time-based codes. And so again, the provider needs to document the amount of time that's being sent and that the uh, patient also needs to provide verbal consent that they are aware that the service is actually being provided via telephone. Again, um, these apply to newer established patients. And one of the things with the telephone only services, because there are only so many things that a provider can, uh, healthcare service that a provider can, um, provide during a telephone call is that these services cannot originate from a visit within the last seven days or if it's related to a visit that's coming up in the next day. So if it's the follow-up to a, a visit from the within the last seven days, that would really still be considered a part of the previous visit. This would be truly that you were addressing a new problem. Um, and again, the place of service code would be an 11, and there is no modifier um, requ are required in this uh, for those types of instances. Um, during this public health um, emergency, um, on the next, and we got it, next slide, um, there's, um, like I said, there are a number of new services that are, are places of services where telehealth services can be provided, emergency rooms, skilled nursing facilities, um, inpatient, outpatient hospital settings. Um, again, we talked about already the um, technology that um, the provider can use, the documentation for time. Um, a couple of things, again, with the 
place of service. The place of service O2 denotes that it's a telehealth service and it would be um, reimbursed at the facility level. So there would be a reduction in the um, E&M service um, allowable versus if it was billed with a place of service 11. The next few slides that I've included are not to make things even more challenging for a provider. What we've gone through here were CMS guidelines, so that would apply to Medicare. They don't necessarily all apply to the commercial payer. So if we take a quick look at Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, one of the things that Anthem and their policy has stated is that they will only up, um, allow for a levels one through three. Um, so 99211 through 99213 for established patients, 99201 through 203 for new patient. Um, again, the documentation requirements would be the same. Um, they can be used for a telephone or audiovisual. Verbal consent needs to be obtained from the patient and needs to be documented. And a place of service O2 would be used for um, Anthem with no modifier necessary because the O2 place of service is telling the payer that it's a telehealth service. Um, United Healthcare, again, it, they have their own specific set of rules, and I won't go through every single one of them, but with United, which makes them a little more challenging because they have Medicare um, replacement programs that they also uh, manage, as well as Medicaid in certain states. So there are going to be different requirements date based on the type of plan that the patient has. So whether it's a um, UHC commercial plan, a UHC Medicare plan, or a Medicaid plan, the rules can be different. On the next slide, TRICARE, again, is one that has a, you know, a list of their own rules that if you are going to provide a telehealth service to a TRICARE beneficiary, those were types of things that you would need to check with the contractor first to see if authorization or referral is actually required. Um, and one of the things um, in TRICARE world, they do not include audio only um, services. So one of the things that we have um, guided, you know, our providers with is that it's very important because again, it's been a very fluid, fluid um, service level offering that, you know, check the payer websites because right now with any of them, Aetna, United, Cigna, it's, they have loosened up the restrictions on telehealth and telemedicine services, and it's important to check them before, check the guidelines before actually providing the service. Um, and I guess now we'll be opening things up for um, questions. Thank you, Michael and Randy. Um, before we jump into questions, I just wanna point everyone's attention to this page here that has some key resources. Um, some of this is available on our website, um, hpkcpa.com, um, and there are also some government resources um, that um, you can access online as well. Uh, this information will be included in the presentation that will be sent out um, later today. So as Randy mentioned, uh, we are able to take some questions. Um, we've gotten a couple of from the audience, and I'll start with this first one that goes out to you, Michael. Uh, the question is coming from um, an attendee who indicated that um, there was an employee in their organization that has indicated that they do not want to come back. And his question is, can I hire someone new at that employee's pay rate? And if so, would I still be eligible for forgiveness on the PPP loan? Yeah, it's, it's a great question um, and probably one that is going to continue to uh, pop up. From what we know today on the forgiveness side, it is a, is a purely FCE versus FTE calculation. But nothing indicates that it has to be the same individual or, or same person. So if, if a person chooses not to come back, let's say that they are chosen to just stay on unemployment if they've applied and receiving the enhanced benefits on that, they choose not to come back, but you replace that person with another full-time equivalent. Um, from what we see, that's kind of a, almost a wash, a trade-off uh, in that calculation. So if any other guidance uh, is produced on that, I'm sure we will be getting that out there uh, because it is a top-of-mind question for a lot of individuals. 
Great. Thank you, Michael. Another question um, that um, is directed towards you is, can we participate in both the PPP and the FFCRA programs and get the tax credit for the employees being off for two weeks or 12 weeks due to child care? So, so the answer is twofold there. Can you participate in both? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what you cannot do is double dip. So any tax credits you receive for payments and payroll made to that employee for the two weeks expanded paid sick leave or, or under the expanded FMLA provisions uh, pursuant to the FFCRA, those payroll costs will be excluded from the loan forgiveness calculation uh, of the PPP. So you can't receive double benefit under each one, but you can participate in both. Uh, we've been advising clients that if you do have such an employee that, that is under the Paid Sick Leave Act or the expanded um, FMLA, notify your payroll company immediately. Right? We want to notify that because there's opportunity to accelerate that tax credit on um, in the interim period on your federal deposits, and you don't necessarily have to wait till July. Great. Thank you, Michael. And here's another question related to PPP. Uh, one of the attendees asked, can we delay the receipt of funds from PPP? That's, that's an interesting one. I, haven't, I actually haven't fielded that one yet. Uh, I'm not sure if you could delay the receipt. That'd be a question I would want to toss to your banking institution, uh, namely because we've seen clients mostly wanting to get those funds in the door as quickly as possible. I don't know. I've not read anything uh, to say you know, if your uh, application is approved by the SBA and you're set to fund seven to ten days later, uh, I'm not sure uh, if the financial institution is obligated to deposit your funds immediately. I know they have a brief window, I think, that they have to deposit. That's a great question uh, for your banker directly. They have to facilitate clearly uh, any conversations with your financial institution in that manner. Great. Thank you, Michael. Randy, this question is for you. Um, have the recent effects mm -hmm events impacted the ability, impacted Medicare and Medicaid payments to providers in any way? It has, you know, from what we have seen, it has not. So, you know, Medicare is still operating under their 14 day payment floor. Um, and we, for, uh, for our uh, Medicare carriers that we've seen down here in the Southeast, there hasn't been a delay in payment. That's great to hear. So we have time for one more question, um, and this could be for Michael or Randy. Um, could you repeat the percent of uh, HHS will fund for the 2019 Medicare fee for service reimbursements? Um, what I stated earlier was seven to nine percent. Now this is based on so the, the, the HHS has released 30 billion of funding. They've also stated that last year in 2019 nationwide. Uh, for Medicare fee for service, there's there were 484 billion of payments made under that program. Now, if we just do simple math, 30 divided by 484 is about six and a quarter percent. So that's what I was expecting to see. Now, a lot of the clients that I've already spoken to this morning are seeing reimbursements anywhere from seven to nine. So uh, HHS was supposed to disperse based on a pro rata percentage or some some sort of resemblance of your share of the 484 last year. Um, so, but I've been seeing percentages higher than that six and a quarter. So I don't know if they're determining certain mechanisms on the back end. Uh, but if it's less than that, I'd, I'd want to have a maybe a call uh, with. I don't know if you can't have a call at this point, but I would have a discussion to say, hey, if it's less than six and a quarter, what happened there? Um, but I've seen it early on. Again, this is just four hours old, anywhere in the seven to nine percent. Mm -hmm. But it's just of the Medicare fee for service reimbursement. Keep that in mind. It's not uh, your total reimbursement pool. Um, we did have one last uh, question come through, and uh, I think, Michael, this is something that maybe you might be able to address. And you noted that the calculations for payroll costs were confusing, and, and uh, in this situation, um, the, the calculation that this particular attendee got from the bank may have changed. Um, it, the, since then, and so it seems to them that their loan could be higher um, and would like to know how they can go about addressing that. Uh, is there anything that they can do going back to their to their lender? 
It's, it's definitely a lender specific question. Uh, my feeling there is if the lender has already submitted the application to the SBA for review of funding, uh, I think your hands are going to be tied there. There was certainly a lot of confusion. Um, more than likely, your, your calculation may be incorrect if you got into the rush last Friday or over the weekend just because there was still so much uncertainty uh, and the clar final clarifications that were desperately needed came out Monday night. So there could be the opportunity for that. Um, you know, on the tail end, it's, it's, if you get a lower amount, would that mean that your propensity for higher reimbursable on the loan forgiveness side? Um, so it's a lending institution specific question. Uh, my gut from some I've talked to already this week, it seems like once they've already submitted to the SBA, it's kind of a done deal. Uh, their, their hands are tied. Uh, but if they haven't yet got to that point, there could be opportunity to revisit the calculation with your lender. Great. Well, again, thank you, Michael and Randy, for sharing this important information. Um, and, and for all those who have who've attended, thank you for participating and for all that you do to help others. Um, this, this concludes our webinar for today. Um, but if you do have any questions, please reach out to Michael, Randy, or your HBK advisor, um, and they'll be able to assist you. Um, and as noted, this information will be made available um, to you via email and on the website later today. Thank you again. Um, stay safe and be well, and we look forward to speaking with you soon.